for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, looks like we are live late night on SFT. Uh, you guys are probably thinking, wow, Standing for Truth is live at all times. Yesterday we had an early stream, earlier stream, I should, I should say, on oil exploration. If you haven't yet seen that, please do check it out. Um, I got interviewed last night as well on evidence for Adam and Eve and independent origins. That interview should be available um, hopefully this weekend. Uh, the gentleman who interviewed me is just editing it a bit before he releases it. So, um, Jamie Russell, poor until Friday. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate the support. Lena Powell, Luca, Doki Doki in the house. Doki Doki Bible Club. Thank you so much for the super sticker, super sticker master. So good to see everybody. Ross. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to make this a few, uh, I'm going to break this up into a few different parts, um, for genetic entropy. You know, this isn't really like a rebuttal video to team dodgeball. Just going to go over some of the basics on genetic entropy, go over some of the more common objections to genetic entropy, because I think the fact of genetic degeneration is a fatal blow to naturalistic evolution. Uh, Doki Doki, you are awesome. $5 super sticker, thank you so much. That makes it all worth it, pulling the all-nighter. Jamie Russell says, <laughs> isn't it 4 a.m. over there? Yep, uh, it's definitely late. And I think it was Luca who says, do you ever sleep? As long as I get five or six hours of power nap, I am good because the creation versus evolution war never rests. Therefore, I never rest. Lena Powell, it was good to see you live um, in a stream. I believe it was yesterday. I, I enjoyed listening to your points, listening to your thoughts. So I'm definitely going to want to have you on here one day. Great news. So we just confirmed for next week, Wednesday, we are going to have Dr. Jason Lyle. He is going to be here. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be the typical interview q a that Ramad and myself do um we're gonna focus a lot on astronomy we're gonna have him demolish the arguments against the biblical creation model that comes from distant starlight he's gonna go over some of the amazing lines of evidence in astronomy for um for young earth creation. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're really looking forward to it. If anybody else were, we're now that it's a week away, we are in the process where we gather questions. Um, and we definitely always love, as you guys know, we love to debunk all the critics, best arguments in these interviews. So any, any questions or anything like that, let me know ahead of time that I can add into our list of questions, but we'll have an audience Q and a as well. Um, Brother George, $5 super chat pizza and ice cream. Yes. I took the I took the day off from pizza. The wife made a nice healthy meal. I promised her no pizza and no ice cream. Wife made some homemade cookies. So cookies and coffee. Lena Powell says, or would that be? Oh, let's see here. Um can he uh, answer some quantum mechanics questions? Well, he's an astrophysicist. So I believe so. A really good debate I'd recommend with Jason Lyle was recently him versus Hugh Ross. This must have happened just a few months ago, and they had an open discussion, and it was it was definitely one to remember. Jason Lyle hit him hard on his model with the, the, the one-way speed of light and uh, synchrony conventions. So that was – I would definitely recommend that one. Um, he's awesome. He's, he's definitely one of my favorites. So, um, brother Nicholas says creation versus evolution war never rests. Therefore standing for truth never rests. Hilarious, but true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then when I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming about creation versus evolution. I'm dreaming about standing for the truth. And, and if something comes to mind as I'm sleeping, then I, then I can't go back to sleep. I'm like, I got to share this with my amazing 
uh, supporters and viewers. You guys are awesome. You guys are the life and blood of this channel. Uh, George Bond and I as well. We've got um, uh, McQueen coming on this Friday. Um, so we're, we're gathering questions for that as well. Um, Brother George, what's his specialty again? We referenced him uh, yesterday. He's written articles for, I believe it's ICR. Um, so that's going to be, it's, it's David McQueen. So he's going to be here Friday, 3 PM EST. So that's going to be awesome. And Dr. McKay, he's going to be here in a couple weeks too. So lots of interviews to look forward to guys. I've got some videos and stuff too, to make this interactive. I'm going to try and break this up into a few different parts. Yeah. Economic geology. That's what I thought. I wanted to make sure that I was right on that one. Um, so be there for some good questions there. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. So we've got a couple of debates as well that I'm in the midst of confirming, but we're definitely going to be having Dr. Stadler on. We still got to discuss his other book on abiogenesis. So guys, genetic entropy, one of my favorite topics I've been, I've been discussing genetic entropy for a couple of years now in debates, discussions, and I talk about it frequently and I want to just kind of go over the basics. Like I said, some of the debunk, some of the more common arguments used against genetic degeneration. But I want to point out the fact too, that the amount of complex engineering and even a single cell is mind boggling to look at a cell and just to, th and just to think that this can all come about by chance for no reason at all from a naturalistic perspective. That's not logical. That's not scientific. We know what we now know about the genome is that it's so much more complex than we have ever thought. Okay. Think of a book. Books cannot be read both forwards and backwards. DNA can be read this way. There's messages in the DNA code, reading it forward or backwards. The DNA language has multiple overlapping codes. It is nested. You hear us talk about this all the time. It is nest. It is essentially polyfunctional and therefore poly constrained. And for everybody listening, anybody new to the channel, genetic entropy is the fact that mutations accumulate faster than natural selection can filter out those mutations. Okay. And another important point to consider is Genetic degeneration and mutation accumulation, it points us to the first couple, Adam and Eve, okay? Um, we can take this point of most mutation accumulation. We accumulate roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation, okay? We are consistently getting more and more mutant. And here's what's funny. You guys in the chat, you probably don't feel too mutant today, do you? Doki Doki, Lena, are you guys feeling more mutant today than you did yesterday? No, of course not. But we are consistently more mutant every single generation. We have 100 roughly more mutations this generation than we had the previous generation. 100 more mutations than our parents had. 200 more mutations roughly than our grandparents had. So the next time somebody says, I know when people say to me, standing, you look tired today. You don't look like yourself. Of course I don't. I'm the most mutant today than I've ever been. <laughs> but um, here's the thing. Most mutations that are accumulating from generation to generation, they are essentially invisible to selection. It's like rust on a car or a single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia, you're not going to notice each single spelling mistake. Each single spelling mis mistake is essentially inconsequential on its own. It's the buildup of them over time. Doki Doki says, I'm looking in a mirror standing. <laughs> Ross Nixon says, my children are mutants. Yep. Consistently more and more mutant. And we can take this point of most mutation accumulation. We can take it back in, in point, uh, into time, to a point of least mutation accumulation, least genetic entropy. That would be a time of creation, a time of perfection, a time of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve would have been born with no mutations. 
and we can see a reflection of the fall in our genome, in our genetics. And the fact that most of these mutations, okay, are invisible to selection as they are only very slightly deleterious. I always point this out and it's a fact because the evolutionists like to say, well, what about selection? You're forgetting about selection. Listen, evolutionists. Okay, listen, critics. We all accept natural selection occurs. It's a fine tuning mechanism. Selection can see the worst of mutations. It can get rid of the worst of mutations. It's a fine tuning mechanism. It can even see the best of mutations, right? One of those rare one in a million beneficial mutations that has some kind of advantage. Selection may be able to see that and even amplify it, okay? But most of these mutations, they're considered effectively neutral or nearly neutral. They accumulate, as I said, like rust on a car. You can't see each individual rust molecule, but over time, okay, regardless of how good you are with your car, you're getting all your oil changes, which reminds me, I actually need an oil change on my car. So there we go. But whether you're, you're changing your oil frequently or changing the tires, getting all your tune-ups. It doesn't matter. Eventually the car is going to be worthless. It's going to break down. Nothing can stop the eventual breakdown of our automobile, uh, automobiles, just like nothing can stop the eventual breakdown of our genetics. Okay. So I just love how genetic entropy points to the first couple, Adam and Eve. You know, when we talk a lot about mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome and um, molecular clocks, genetic diversity, but mutation accumulation as well points us to, it also points us to our, our, our need for a savior, right? To the unbeliever, the reality of genetic entropy can be very daunting. It can be scary. But to us, as born-again believers, our hope is in Christ. And we know that Christ will return before the eventual extinction of our, of our race, of our species. Lena says, I do not get how nature complexity leads to more complex cells. You claim that the cell was very simple at the very beginning, don't you? Yeah, that's why I've, I've been going over this abiogenesis challenge, posing to the critics these large numbers of chicken and egg problems after chicken and egg problems. Ross Nixon says mutants survive if there is no massive resource slash food shortage. Yeah, in, 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 when, when they say it's survival of the fittest, a lot of the times it's more so survival of the luckiest, okay? You know, natural selection really comes down to who's having the most babies, differential reproduction, who's having the most kids. If you're not passing on your genetics, you're not having kids, well then your line, evolutionary speaking, is going to be dead. You know, you got to pass on your genes. The more kids, the better. But regardless of that, I've got a few clips here actually. So pretty soon I'm going to show you some clips. One from Brother Sal, I think he nails it. I think he nails it and I want you guys to see it. Um, but another thing that comes to mind too is the fact that not only does genetic entropy point us to Adam and Eve, the first couple, but it clearly puts shelf lives on genomes. And here's what's funny. Evolutionists claim that mutations, typographical errors in a text, okay, a typographical error in a text is more likely to ruin the message in some way than actually make it better. Okay, mutations are more likely to break something down than actually build it up. This is just basic. But evolutionists want to say that mutations are the source for all variety. You know, natural selection acting upon random mutations, random variations took that single celled like creature into a multi celled like creature, which evolved into a fish and then an amphibian, reptile, mammal, monkey, bird. You know, think of it like farm, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, all through mutations, natural selection act acting upon these mutations, the driving force of evolution. But what we know based on empirical science is that mutations are the destroyer. 
not the creator. And the best beneficial mutations that they can point to, the reductive. They're functionally compromising to organisms, even if they have a slight advantage, okay? Like I said earlier, we are more mutant than our parents consistently. We have 100 roughly new mutations that our parents did not have, okay? In natural selection, sure, I'm not against natural selection. It's going to keep the species as strong as they can be. But the question is, can selection actually stop the eventual degeneration of humans and other species? Okay. What this all means, guys, the bigger picture, it means that an ape-like creature could never have evolved into man. Pond scum could never have evolved into people. This is a fatal blow to universal common ancestry, not to mention the functionality of our genome. Did you know that even if our genome was only 10% functional, which we know there's preliminary evidence that suggests it's roughly 70 or 80% functional, even if it was only 10% functional, that would mean human evolution is impossible. That's 10 deleterious mutations accumulating from generation to generation. Evolutionists need as much junk as possible. They want those mutations to hit those junk areas where those junk areas now absorb those mutations, making them neutral. But they're really running out of junk, which means they're really running out of arguments to combat genetic degeneration. That's why these mutations, they are effectively neutral. And this is not good for evolution. So, guys, I want to play a clip here that I got from Brother, Brother Sal, who I think, um, Doki Doki Super Sticker, thank you so much. Uh-oh, Troublemakers here. LPP in the house. John Maddox, you're turning into a night owl like myself, brother. I like it. I like it. Uh, if you want to join a bit and, and give us your thoughts on um, genetic entropy and the Rescue devices employed by the science deniers. Let me know, brother. It's always a pleasure. Anybody not subbed to John yet? Please do. John is the man. Um, so let's see. I'm going to share a screen re real quick. And let's see. Share audio. I want to show you this good explanation from Sal in his debate with Dan Cardi now. And Dan dodged this illustration that... Sal gave, okay, and you guys can watch the debate to see that for yourself, but Sal nailed it here, okay? Essentially what Sal is saying here, I'm going to use a different analogy than, than Sal does to make this different. Picture a room. You got a room full of people, okay? Every single person is a mutant, okay? Every single person has mutations. Therefore, Let's say we get rid of the worst, 50% of the worst mutants in that room, okay? Well, now you're still left with 50% of the people in that room that are more mutant than the generation before it. That's why even with an extensive amount, even with a, a, a generous amount of natural selection, purifying selection, okay, humans animal species, they're consistently getting worse and worse. What are you going to do? Eliminate the entire population? <laughs> Since the entire population is essentially mutant. You could, Like I said, you just get rid of the worst and you're still left with a bunch of mutants essentially, okay? So no amount of purifying selection is going to solve the problem. I've got the audio on. I am. I, I do suffer from short-term memory loss. Therefore, I'm going to look at the chat from my phone and let me know if it works. I, I really want you guys to see Sal's explanation here. But you know what? I want you guys to see Sal's explanation without any kind of echo. So I'm going to go here. And I know I talk a lot, so I'm going to be silent during this, brothers and sisters. Um, I'm going to click mute and let's listen in. on the other hand, organisms are designed, then all DNA, or as much as possible, is expected to exhibit function. If ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. And we'll talk a little bit more in this uh, debate about the ENCODE project consortium. It was a, so far a $500 million 
um, project by the National Institutes of Health. So let me illustrate the problem again. Assuming we have, let's say, I'll just pick the number since he mentioned 82 mutations, let's suppose it's 80 mutations. There's some parameters here we could talk about that shows why this uh, little simplification is valid. But suppose at generation zero, we have this parent free of birth defects and that parent has a child with 60 mutations and has even more children. But on average, all the children have about 80 mutations. So even if we had perfect selection and wiped out, well, the parent passes away and perfect selection comes along and wipes out the worst, but even the best of the worst of, of the uh, defected children uh, survives and has mutations and becomes a parent to the next generation. So we will repeat this process. And it, it should be evident that as Dan Grauer said, if we have a mutation rate of 80 per individual per generation, there'll be genetic deterioration. And all I'm doing is illustrating this. So parent dies and we have elimination of the worst, but still even under survival of the fittest, the genome keeps deteriorating. And I'm just gonna keep repeating this and you can see the numbers increasing. This is something Dan Brower observed. I know I have a minute and a half and I'm almost done. So fast forward to a million ge generations, uh, we'll have a million, mutate, 60 million mutations at that point. And this uh, one solution to this problem was proposed by Susumu Ono. This was understood by many population geneticists that uh, we cannot tolerate too many mutations. So they said one solution to this is to invoke junk DNA. And he said, there's So as you can see, no matter what you do, no matter how much purifying selection you allow for, we are consistently getting more and more mutant. That's why the evolutionists oftentimes have a difficult time answering the question, okay? The question being, hey, do you think man is presently getting better? Or is it clear that man is presently degenerating? Because I think we can all agree that man is clearly degenerating. We're not getting any better. Okay, sickness and disease is on the rise. Environment, okay? Genetics plus environment oftentimes equals phenotype. Environment now is now known to have a huge cause. Um, let me see. Uh, okay. So I want to go to, and what's funny is I'm going to go, I'm going to show you guys this clip. It's a clip from my first debate with uh, Erica, where she kind of just threw it out there. Like, what about natural selection? And I just find it so funny that evolutionists actually think for a second that we don't acknowledge the role of natural selection. Okay. Natural selection for one, is not a creative force. It creates nothing. Keeps the species as, as strong as it can be. Okay? A good analogy for selection, fine-tuning. Take every single dog on the planet today. And Ken Hoven uses this example a lot. And I like it. It's understandable. Take every single dog today and, and, and throw them into Alaska. Give it enough generations, you're going to be left with nothing but the husky type. The wolf type that have adapted to that environment. They got the thick fur, okay? Now take all of those dogs and put, it, put them into the deserts of Australia. A few generations, you're gonna be left with nothing but the dingo type, right? Skinny, long legs, built for that environment, okay? It's not creating anything. But enter mutations, which evolutionists say are the driving force. But mutations destroy, and they have no way to filter out all these mutations that are pouring in from generation to generation. Gene duplication. Gene duplications are universally deleterious. And if you're duplicating a gene that has already accumulated deleterious mutations, you're accumulating the deleterious mutations with it, that gene that's already been degenerating, it's just speeding up the process. Gene duplication is not gonna help. I wanna play this video for you guys. Let me mute myself too. I'll enter the chat.
financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. She followed that up with a quick one where she said, gene duplication is a very old concept. And she also said, I love Nickelback. I don't know why. <laughs> I made that last yeah, part. No. The evolutionists will often look to gene duplication as a way to add novel information to the genome. But I mean, if, you, if I give you a copy of a book that you already own, and then I start introducing typographical errors into the second copy of the book you already own, now you just have a more messed up copy of the original book. So it's just more evidence for genetic degeneration. It comes down to net gain versus net loss. So that ain't going to help. Gotcha. Quick, quick, quick add on that, though. What about natural selection? Ooh, that's right. Natural that. selection, though, the problem is, is it can't act upon those near neutral mutations that are unselectable. Those are the ones that, that build up. Sure, it's going to amplify the best beneficials and get rid of the worst detrimentals. It's the near neutral mutations that accumulate and, and degenerate our information system. So that'll have to be the, the problem you'll have to address, Erica. So there you go. Natural selection is no help to the evolutionists, okay? Look at this. Beneficial mutations are extremely rare. Sister Joe, good to see ya. She says, hi, guys. Can only watch for a few minutes. Unfortunately, I'm off to work. God bless you all. God bless you as well. Even if you're here for just a few minutes, it's worth it. We like to see ya. And don't work too hard tonight. So Joe's going to be going to work while a lot of us are going to be going to bed. Uh, Ramad in the house. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Um, Flash Gore. Yeah, uh, uh, it's set to private right now. Um, we'll see if, if we put it back to public. And let's see who else. Yeah, good to see everybody here. Um, yeah, awesome. Somebody made a good point about selection. Let me see. I think that was you, Flash. Flash Gordon says, natural selection only selects and it takes a conscious being to make any choices. Nature of itself can choose nothing. So the term natural selection is a self-defeating contradiction. Yeah, I like that point. Good point. Just like I, I explained to um, Erica here, selection is going to remove the worst deleterious mutations. Okay, in the wild, say a, a, a zebra is born with a mutation that gives it a shorter leg or a fifth leg or something. Well, that zebra is not going to last too long against the lion. I'll tell you that much. So, um, but here's the thing. What if I'm born with a mutation that gives me a fifth, a sixth finger or, you know, something, uh, something visibly where someone would look at, at you and think, you know, what's wrong with that guy? Well, that's not going to stop me necessarily from having kids and propagating. Okay, so there's a lot of mutations that can get through from generation to generation. Yeah, your worst, your worst deleterious detrimental mutation, especially in the wild. Okay, and as humans, we um, we help each other out. You know, we have hospitals, so it's not quite like the wild, the survival of the fittest that we see in the wild. But the problem is, most of those mutations are, are just too subtle to the point where selection can't see them. Uh, so let's see here. Lynch, Keatley, beneficial mutations are extremely rare. The vast majority of mutations are deleterious. This is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics, supported by both molecular and quantitative genetic data. Yeah, and Paul Price from CMI, he made a lot of good points, and he had a lot of good quotes, okay, from PhDs on this. So that's why I've got his... Uh, debate with Dr. Garrett pulled up. I'm going to show you some of the quotes that he has. Um, 
Let's see. Yeah, Ramad says we have far too many here to find anything. Yeah, I've what I'm gonna do. A lot of these little clips that I have here, I found from just months and months and months ago. We got over a thousand videos, so I've done my best to make some playlists for you guys. But I'm gonna have the best of SFT night or classic SFT classics or something like that. Where Ramad and I, what we'll do is we'll find some of the older videos that I don't think a lot of you have seen. They're kind of diluted down, right? Um, which brings me back to genetic entropy. A lot of times these beneficial mutations pop up, but guess what? They're masked by all the huge, huge, huge numbers of deleterious mutations. And even if you get a beneficial mutation that is amplified, okay, fine. All of those deleterious mutations that have been accumulating, guess what? They're passed on too. Selection acts on what? Selection acts on the phenotype, not the genotype, okay? You can't see each individual nucleotide, okay? And that's the problem the evolutionists have is <laughs> selection. You're not going to, as, as we said earlier, what are you going to do? Every single human on this planet is mutant, okay? We just going to take them all out? No, of course not. Of course not. Um, uh, Ramat. Yeah, so we got a Facebook page. Please, Facebook, uh, Standing for Truth dash Creation Ministry. Go hit that like button. I'm going to do my best to stay active on it. And let me finish this video real quick. There's some good quotes here. Doki Doki. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the old triggered videos with the Nicolas Cage faces. Oh, that's so funny. Matt, I wonder if you can find... Um, you made a couple videos of some of my really old debates from two years ago where uh, I think it's called Atheist Triggered. See if somebody can find that. We'll, we'll put it in for a good laugh with Nicholas. <laughs> Doki, I'm glad you remember that one. That one was hilarious. I'm telling uh, – Lucas says Facebook, never heard of it. Yeah, it's this new thing um, that's popped up. I'd say avoid it, Lu Luca. It's, it's going to take up too much of your time. You're going to be constantly clicking that that uh, Facebook icon on your phone. You'll never get any work done. <laughs> um, yeah, so you two or, or uh, type in f uh, Facebook, standing for truth dash creation ministry is, is what I named it. So, okay, Jamie, I'll, I'll look out for you, brother. Um, yeah, Matt, that was such a funny video. Maybe I'll be able to find it um, when I play the next video. So let's see. Let's finish this one. Oh, here, I want to read this. As mutations accumulate, selection interference gets worse and worse. Selection efficiency progressively breaks down such that only the best and worst mutations are selectable. Hey, good to see you, Brother Sal. Salvador Cordova is in the house. Um, yeah, Sal, we, you missed it. You're famous. You were the star of the night for a few minutes there. We showed, I should say, I showed your, um, your example of genetic entropy and, and how it can't be stopped in your debate with Dan. So you're a blessing brother. And everybody, please go, go to the playlist section. I, I've uh, made a playlist. It's titled protein probabilities lecture series. Part one and two are there from uh, Sal. And we're going to be having part three this week as well. Here's another thing right here. Beneficials cannot keep up with deleterious mutations. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Oftentimes I say, okay, evolutionists, you can have one or two. Heck, you can have five truly beneficial mutations that are not deleterious in any way, shape, or form. But guess what? One or two or five beneficial mutations are not going to be able to counterbalance the damage done by all of these low impact mutations that accumulate from generation to generation. Okay. It's, it's hilarious. Um, right here, near, near neutrals should be virtually unstoppable and they are numerical simulations have been done. It's all been figured out. It's all in papers. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here.
Okay, so let's see. Let, let's get to some objections. Objections are fun. Let's deal with them. So one of them has to do with mice and bacteria. Really, really uninformed critics, they like to point to bacteria. You know, if genetic entropy is true, why is there still bacteria or mice? So that's going to be the first objection I want to deal with. But before I do that, I want to show you guys. And this one I'm going to do at a little faster speed here. Because I think Carter breaks it down nicely as well. He's going to kind of reiterate what I was saying. But he makes some really good points. And what I titled this was, Critics Deny the Reality. Critics Deny the Truth of Genetic Entropy, which is true. It's like denying reality. And it's because... They're scared because according to the naturalistic worldview, well, genetic entropy means there's no hope. But I'm telling you, the hope should be put in Christ. Our hope is in heaven. Okay, so I'm going to play this video. Once again, you're not going to hear much from me. I'm going to put it on 1.75 speed. And we'll do 1.5 in case that's too fast. I'm going to mute myself so there's no echo. And I'll join you guys in the chat while we sit back, relax, and watch Dr. Carter destroy naturalism. True. Please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. In fact, according to our model, we believe that the scripture talks about we living in a fallen world. And the evidence appears to show and indicate that we live in a world that has been degenerated from creation. Okay. Um, well, if we see rapid decay in our genomes due to mutations, is this what we're really seeing? And is this, um, this seems to all go back to the concept of genetic entropy, kind of a Sanford's model, right? So, Dr. Carter, what is the genetic entropy exactly? And what are some of the best lines of evidence supporting it? Genetic entropy is the idea that if most mutations are weak, natural selection can't see them. In order for natural selection to operate, a variation has to affect reproduction. Either you die young or you don't have as many children or whatever it is. It's something that affects how many children you have. If most mutations, like, I mean, you and I and everyone listening were born with about a hundred mutations that our parents didn't have when they were born. And I don't feel like a mutant, but I have a hundred new spelling errors in my genome. And those mutations, I might have a broken gene. I might have an effect of something else. I might have some rearrangement somewhere. They're just, I mean, if you had like, a, if you had a textbook for biology class and it was handwritten, I would expect to find a few mutations in that textbook. Let's say that at the end of every year, the student has to hand in for his final project a handwritten copy of his textbook, and the original is destroyed. And then the next year's class, they're handed the textbooks that were copied the year before. And every year, a new copy is made, a new copy is made, a new. Eventually, no one will be able to pass biology class because right. there'll be so many mistakes in the books. It'll be it'll be totally worthless. And that's an analogy of what's happening in the genome. If we are picking up mutations every generation, that means we're going downhill, and eventually we will have to go extinct mathematically. That's so good. No, I was gonna say, yeah, that's an awesome answer. So essentially, Dr. Carter, we're more mutant today than we've ever been. And even on a population level, if you were to, let's say, get rid of the worst of the worst, you're still left with people who are more mutant than the generation before it. Yep, yeah, very simple. It now it we've seen this um, massive computer models. Uh, there's a, a program written called Mendel's Accountant that was written by Sanford and uh, several computer scientists. It was designed specifically to test ideas of evolution and genetic entropy using nothing but evolutionary assumptions. It's really interesting that the most comprehensive evolutionary modeling program was written by creationists. Right, right. And they went out on a limb because they might have been wrong. Right, and it seems like um, the criticisms that I've read, I guess, in blogs is typically where you find it. It, it. it almost appears like they have no understanding of the program to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And they almost never understand that this objection they raise was systematically analyzed and published. Right, right. So truncation selection, synergistic ep epistasis, all these things they might throw at these big words they try to throw at you. Wait, wait. Oh, that was in this article right here. Oh, you're not going to read it, are you? No. Yeah. It seems like um, the criticisms that I've read, I guess, in blogs is typically where you find it. It, it. it almost appears like they have no understanding of the program to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And they almost never understand that this objection they raise was systematically analyzed and published. Right, right. So truncation selection, synergistic ep epistasis, all these things they might throw at these big words they try to throw at you. Wait, wait. Oh, that was in this article right here. Oh, you're not going to read it, are you? No. Yeah, right. I, I find that um, in, in my own experience where uh, a critic brought up and, and I'll send them a, a technical paper that, that's been published that explains the data and then I never hear from them again. So like you said, I, I don't think they're even uh, reading it. But the greatest place to see genetic entropy, actually there's two. One's in the human genome. If you look at this, you know, seven and a half billion people in the world today, essentially every single possible mutation has happened in the human genome millions of times only in this generation. If every person is born with 200-ish mutations, there's seven and a half billion people, there's only three billion letters in the genome. 
Wow. Oh. <laughs> when you think of it that way, it's, it's a, for us, our, our hope is in Christ. So, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not a scary thing essentially because our hope is in heaven, but for the unbeliever, you know, that can be a, a daunting fact to accept. Yeah. So they just generally just dismiss it without considering because to consider right. it means a lot, there's a lot of implications behind it. I and mean, that means that we're picking time bomb. Our species, there's a limit how long we can live, which makes right. sense universally. I mean, second right. law of thermodynamics applies to everything. It applies to information also. It's not just about molecules in a dish. It applies to all systems, all systems, errors accumulate over time. And that's what we're seeing in the genome. Right, right. Awesome point. Well, um, Dr. Carter, I've seen critics of the genetic entropy model. I've seen them. This is a common one. Um, and, and this was also brought up in Paul Price's debate. And Paul Price did a phenomenal job. They'll say that Komora has been misrepresented and apparently beneficial mutation should be able to counterbalance the damage done by deleterious mutation accumulation. What would be the best way to counter such a, a criticism? Um, that, again, has been thoroughly analyzed using Mendel's account. Right. So using nothing but, you know, Kamura's model and, and neutral evolution. They, you can put in whatever mutation spectrum you want. How many positive mutations would you like? How many negative mutations would you like? How strong are they? What's your distribution of mutations? Are most of them nearly neutral or some, are most of them really bad or really good? Put in whatever distribution you want, put it into your model, run it over time. And if you have some super beneficial good mutation, yes, it will amplify itself in the genome while you're going extinct. Because wow. if you're selecting for that particular variant, like maybe it makes you 10 feet tall and you know, it's strong, strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're super smart <laughs> and you know, everything all together. It just, it, maybe it doubles the amount of children that you have. Well, if that's being selected that strongly, that means that everything in the region around it is also being selected. And it's carried along with it. all these bad mutations that are accumulating are carried along with that good mutation. Right. And you have a dramatic loss of diversity in that area because all the other variants are not being uh, amplified, only that one at the expense of everything else. And so what happens is you have fixation of that good mutation and fixation of all the bad mutations along with it. Got it. So there's no counterbalance at all. Got it. No. In fact, I just read a paper last week, two weeks ago, and they said that most of the human genome is under purifying selection. Meaning that even if most of that material really isn't very functional, the functional areas are carrying along all the non-functional stuff with it. Right. Boom. That's exactly the idea. So yeah, you can select for blue eyes or, or lactose tolerance or sickle cell anemia, but that means that everything in that neighborhood in the genome is also being selected. Right. Yeah. So the evolutionists have to address the key issue, which would be net gain versus net loss. And although by the sounds of it, you can increase fitness occasionally in a, in a very narrow sense, but the entirety of the genome is still degenerating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Example of fitness gain would be um, the increase in sickle cell anemia in Central Africa. That sickle cell is a de debilitating uh, disease. It's a terrible disease. It hurts. It kills people. But if your red blood cells have the ability to crystallize, if the hemoglobin has the ability to crystallize inside your blood, that tears apart the malaria parasites that live inside the red blood cells. So it's better to have the sickle cell trait in the presence of malaria than to be dead. Right, right. So it's a very strong selective pressure, and yet it's selecting for something that's bad. And we see that all over the place. There's so many broken things in the genome that are selectable. Tons of them. Right. So, so it sounds like even though beneficial mutations are rare, when you do get a beneficial mutation like sickle cell anemia, for example, that has a significant impact, overall it's due to something broken and it's still reductive in some way. Yeah, almost all so-called beneficial mutations are reductive. In fact, they're not beneficial, except in a very specific context. Right. Like, you know, the, the blind cave fish. Why would you want to lo lose an eyeball? Didn't it take you a half a billion years to evolve that eyeball in the first place? <laughs> right. Well, in a cave where there's no light, you don't want an eyeball. You get a scrape, you get a fungal infection, you're dead. If you don't have any eyeballs, that the most sensitive part of your body is not present. Okay. So that's a strongly selectable trait in a dark environment, but it's totally going the wrong direction. And that's what we see. Almost every case of a strongly selectable trait is something going backwards. Well, what's funny, it seems like the evidence is clear. Everything you're saying is, is, is amazing confirmation evidence of a world that was once perfect and now has descended into degeneration, death, extinction. Yeah, Lena Pow, Lena Pow nailed it. My favorite, it will amplify itself in the genome while you are going extinct. You know, I love that clip from Dr. Carter and I love how he points out the fact, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys a clip in a minute from. Uh, it's a clip from Dr. Sanford's interview that he just had with Dr. Tour, where he points out, and as Dr. Carter just pointed out there, that a lot of these objections that the critics bring up, for example, like Dr. Dan, okay, that they try to attempt to say that has, has not been dealt with those arguments have actually been dealt with extensively using Mendel's accountant okay where you can set all these numbers of parameters set all the amount of beneficial mutations purifying selection that you want and it always shows that what is inevitable 
is the eventual genetic degeneration of our species. And I, I pointed out based on what Dr. Carter was saying there, the fact that, um, let me see. I just looking at the chat here. Doki Doki says, I, f I feel like they want to have their cake and eat it too standing mutations are neutral but get noticed and selected out to for peak fitness yep it's um oh and jamie russell made a good point they need far fewer mutations and more generations but even then there would be this issue it seems to me especially for humans yeah they want their cake and eat it too they oftentimes do when it comes to these arguments now here's the thing it comes down to Net gain versus net loss. That's why oftentimes I don't care if there are one or two truly beneficial mutations. For one, they're rare. Two, when they do occur, as Dr. Carter pointed out, they're typically reductive. They're going in the opposite direction than would be needed for fish to fisherman evolution. Fine, have 10 of them. It's still not gonna counterbalance the damage because all of those mutations are still being passed on from generation to generation. Selection acts on the phenotype, okay? So it comes down to a trade-off. I debated Dr. Stefan Frello about a year ago. Uh, definitely check out that debate. That was a good one. But his main argument was, you know, there's a trade-off. These beneficial mutations oftentimes, although they're reductive and sometimes they're damaging, they're environmentally dependent. So if we get a truly beneficial mutations or sometimes we'll get a super beneficial mutation or a duplication that's, that's beneficial, there's a trade-off. Yeah, there's a lot of deleterious mutations accumulating, but those truly beneficial mutations or duplications, you know, those will offset the damage, which is ridiculous, which is ridiculous. And I pointed out in that debate, and he gave no rebuttal, I said, listen, the, de the, the genome is degenerating, okay? Now, while the genome is degenerating, no one's going to disagree with that, a few nucleotide sites may be improving. Okay, okay. But guess what? Massive numbers are being degraded. You know what this means? That type of trade-off that people like Dr. Frello, Dr. Dan speak of is not sustainable. I like to typically ask the question, fine, but is that type of trade-off sustainable? And it's not. And what it results in, guys, is a shrinking functional genome size. Look at Lenski's experiment. There's a ton of trade-off. And his uh, Lenski's bacterial populations, they've shrunk in functional genome size. So basically, guys, what's happening, okay, is you are throwing out lots of information, okay? You're throwing out lots of information from lots of nucleotide sites. And then you're trying to replace all of that information with, a few single desirable point mutations, duplications, okay? No, it's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to offset the damage. And I can't emphasize it enough, but the fact that most beneficials are reductive and they're not even taking things forward, they are degrading to organisms. And yeah, that is why I highly recommend watching the lecture from Sal on evolutionary fitness and how worthless it is. Because according to the evolutionary definition of fitness, those blind cave fish or the wingless beetles on those islands, according to the evolutionists, that's an increase in fitness. But they are left functionally compromised. <laughs> They're losing things. I mean, how do they not see it? So yeah, sometimes you can get an increase in fitness in a very narrow sense. But overall, okay, overall there's a decrease in absolute fitness. We should be able to differentiate between absolute fitness and reproductive fitness. Okay, so this is important. They're major, major argument or objection, and I know from experience debating Dr. Frello on this, it's, it's the trade-off argument, okay? But I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, all it's gonna do is result in shrinking functional genome sizes, okay? So let's break this down, guys. Let's break this down, guys. So evolutionist, creationist, okay, everybody in the chat, we all agree, natural selection happens. You heard, you heard Erica and her argument in that first clip. What about natural selection? We agree it happens. What have we learned so far? Well, natural selection will remove the worst mutations. They'll amplify the best, sure. But all this indicates is that the damage that is accumulating, for one, it's mostly invisible, like rust on a car, but it's also unselectable. And evolutionists never want to address the, the key issue of net gain versus net loss. So guys, this is just a home run for a home run hit for, for biblical creationists. Okay, so uh, Doki Doki, thank you so much for the super sticker. Jamie Russell says, wouldn't there be uh, way more evidence that mutations were neutral or beneficial? Seems like the mutations that cause problems are far too numerous. We call them disease. This seems to be the death nail. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Where's all these beneficial mutations? How can we see so many birth anomalies, birth defects popping up? Where's all the beneficial ones? <laughs> they should be far outweighing the, the, the ones that are damaging. Oh, guys, you can't make this stuff up. Brother Sal says, oh, Salvador's on one of his other accounts. <laughs> Sal's the king of, um, what do they call those, sock accounts? He says, I think it was my debate number one with Dr. Dan where I asked if he, yeah, I, I mentioned that uh, at the beginning, Sal. So, um Guys, listen to this. Sal says he asked Dan whether or not the, hu the human genome was deteriorating. I seem to recall he dodged the question. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. The five Ds of dodge. That's what dodgeball Dan does the best. Lena Pow says, yes, therefore he is dodgeball the first. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's definitely earned the MVP. So uh, Sal asked him, you know, are you saying that man, would you say that man is getting better or is man presently degenerating? And he dodged, didn't want to ask that. It'd make him look bad. Um, Brother Sal says, restream simulcast test looks promising. Awesome. He says, I can restream a potential debate with diaper dino regarding evolutionary fitness. Yes. Yes. Uh, these evolutionists, they like to uh, complain wine. Nobody's even attempting to address the lecture series of uh, Brother Sal. And um, Dapper Dino has devolved into Diaper Dino with all his demands. Isn't it, isn't it funny how he's challenged? It was in his image. He challenged him to a debate on, on uh, fitness. But when I uh, challenged him to debate Sal instead, Sal's given lectures on this. Suddenly, there's a large number of, of requests. And I, I think Team Dodgeball is just, you know, I think they're, I think they know they're losing. So, um, and lots more to come, guys. So, yeah, definitely, um, Sal, let, let us know when that is. We're here to support you. Friday, I think. And then we got you for a lecture, too. Jamie says, oh, yeah, my gas mileage is much better. Here, think about this. Let's say we wanted better gas mileage. That's a good point. Just for the time being. Okay, I'm driving in a car. We want better gas mileage. So I decide to start throwing things off. Okay? Take off the door. Take off the side mirrors. Rip out the middle console. Rip out one of the seats. I don't know. Just start throwing things off, you know, decreasing weight on the car. Okay, yeah, for the time being, you're going to get better gas mileage. So in a way, you've improved, you know, quote, unquote, fitness in a narrow sense. But overall, you're destroying the car. It's not getting any better. Would anybody say that that car is now improved? Because for the evolutionists who want to say that, yeah, that car is better now. I'm glad you did that. Better gas mileage. The car, it's decreased in weight, not as heavy. I, I dare them to go do that to their own car. <laughs> I mean, oh, 
Jamie Russell says, they pretend mutation is just whatever. There is no up or down. Oh, yeah, they love to say that. There's no up or down. There's no direction. You know, you don't understand evolution, they say. And he says, except when they need it. Oh, how cute. BB Dino. Yeah, you know, I actually pointed that out in a, in a discussion recently. I should um, I should pull that up. Doki Doki says, I take out Jamie from the car. It will drive itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take your cell phone. That'll uh, improve gas mileage. So, yeah, sure, you can improve gas mileage. Start tearing things off. Remove weight from the car. It's not going to make anything better. But here's another thing, too. Dr. Sanford talks about this, okay? It's something called selection interference, okay? And based on the fact that these mutations are accumulating, most of them are deleterious, and beneficial mutations are so rare and reductive to the point where they're not going to be able to make up for the type of com uh, compensation that's needed to stop the net loss of damage overall, okay? Um, uh, Sal always says that those beneficial mutations are functionally compromising to the organisms, and I like that. Now, selection interference, okay? Here's a problem. Selecting for one trait interferes with selecting for another trait. Now, when you have billions of traits segregating in the population, what happens is selection, the selection process, it actually starts to work against itself. And this isn't good because what you end up with is being able to only select once again, the best and worst mutations. And they haven't solved these problems. I love when people say, you know, only creationists believe in genetic entropy. Well, that's funny. Why are population geneticists trying their best to solve the issue? Why are they coming up with all these rescue mechanisms like synergistic epistasis, mutation count mechanism? Give me a break. Um, uninformed evolutionists, sure. They don't know anything about genetic entropy and what the population geneticists are saying. Um, so let me see. I'm going to share another video for you guys. Good to see everybody here. Lucas says, my car has two seats only. The two behind are not really seats. It's not that bad. You know, okay, here's an example from a car, guys. And I'm trying to use as many analogies, make this understandable as possible. Here's, here's your worst detrimental mutations or defects, okay? If suddenly the engine of the car jumped into the back seat, yeah, your car is going to be destroyed. It's going to be dead in that instant, okay? But if you're just getting rust or you have kind of a minor issue where you can still drive the car, you know, these are the things that are akin to those effectively neutral mutations, okay? Your engine jumps into the back seat. Yeah, you know, you better jump out of that car and save your life. That's going to be noticeable. Those are those really detrimental mutations that are, that are seen. Natural selection is going to, going to see those and get rid of those. Uh, Luca says the two behind are not really seats. It's not that bad. <laughs> If you, uh, yeah, L Luca, get rid of those two seats. I'm telling you, man, your gas mileage, it's going to be improved for the better. You're going to save a ton of money. Lena Pow says, Kondrashov, Lynch, they're not creationists. Exactly. Exactly. Lena knows her stuff. I'm impressed. Jamie Russell, they are not looking for little tricks to get around the problem, but it will not happen. Yeah, they can't solve the problem. It's been dealt with. All, all your, your rebuttals that, that consist of like, you know, Dan will say, I want to see the math. Show me the math. It's like the math has been done. The numerical simulations have been done. Uh-oh. Doki Doki, the life of the party. I always say the party doesn't start till Doki walks in and says she's going to be right back. I just said she by accidentently there, Doki. I think that was just because of the your icon there. So let's see. Super sticker, thank you so much. Yeah, let, you guys are awesome in the chat. You guys always um, bring up great points. That's why I like interacting with you guys. Alec Cox says, the fact that E. coli can be mutated, but they die early and hard to reproduce. Yep. Lenski's experiment is showing clear evidence for genetic degeneration. Those bacteria are not getting better. So that brings us to... The um, 
we've dealt with the trade-off. We've dealt with people like Dan who say, show us the math. What about this? What about that? And you show them a paper, an article where it's been dealt with using Mendel's accountant and numerical simulations. You know, that's just to obfuscate the issue. People like Dan want to deceive their audience who are not actually going to go look at the papers that we are referring to. He wants to deceive them into thinking that these have not been answered or dealt with. It doesn't matter what you invoke. You can set any number of parameters you want. And the answer is still always the same. Genetic degeneration cannot be stopped, okay? Um, Alec Cox says, did you get the large Big Gulp coffee tonight? Yes, the XL. The XL. That's why I'm up a little bit later. And wow, it's already been over an hour. You guys are too much fun. That, that, that's, this is why I said we got to break this up into a few parts. Lena Pow says, Lenski said that only one out of a million mutations is beneficial. Imagine the implications of that. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why when people try and say, oh, you know, Dr. Sanford, he ignored beneficial mutations. You know, Kimura. Kimura said that beneficial mutation, mutations could offset the damage. That is so funny. For one, it's a rabbit trail. Two, it shows that they've never read the literature. Because, yeah, Kimura just throws it out there. Like it's nothing, he just says it with no empirical evidence, doesn't back it up at all, okay? He can say anything he wants. If he doesn't back it up, then it means nothing. It means nothing. And now we know that those one in a million mutations are reductive, functionally compromising, okay? And even if they have a few truly beneficial mutations that have added new novel information to the genome, fine, you can have a few, it ain't going to do nothing to counterbalance the damage. So let's deal with the, uh, the bacteria. So I had a full debate about a year ago with a guy. His name was Condor Man. And he trolled my channel every single day because for the first year of my debates, I really utilized genetic entropy. And uh, nowadays, I really like to utilize um, I, uh, mitochondria, like the, the evidence for independent origins and stuff like that. So he would always troll my, my channel comment sections saying, oh, how do you deal with bacteria? You know, bacteria and simple organisms like mice, it destroys your argument of, of genetic entropy, showing that he understands very little about genetic entropy because we're talking about, you know, mammals, humans. But here's the thing, even mice have evidence for genetic degeneration. And bacteria, when you look at these bacterial experiments, like Lenski's experiment, we even see genetic degeneration there. But I had a full debate with him on Modern Day Debate about a year ago. Didn't go well for him. I'm going to show you guys a clip from that debate, okay? And then I'm going to also show you Dr. Carter's response to it as well. And Dr. Dan used this argument against Sal in their debate, and I've seen him use it in his videos. And I don't know why they're still using this argument, but it doesn't work. And it actually uh, just shows a misrepresentation and straw man understanding from, from them. So I'm going to share screen, share audio, and I'm going to mute myself as well, guys, so you can hear this. More mutations can slip are, under the are radar. Are you disagreeing with? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you disagreeing with the fact that bacteria, bacterial genomes are more simple than, say, a human genome? I mean, you can just Google our bacteria or what's the most simple life on earth, and it's it's a bacteria. So it sounds like you're grasping at straws here in order to be able to imagine that you know losing information, the degradation of our genome is going to take your bacteria-like organism into something like a whale over time. I know you're not defending evolutionism here, but at the end, I just want to point something out because I think this is a straw man because the, the, the central part of genetic entropy is that mutations, which are just spelling mistakes in, in the DNA, for example, they're accumulating so quickly in some creatures, say uh, human beings, for example, that natu natural selection, it, it can't stop the functional degradation of, of the genome, let alone it's a double whammy because it can't 
obviously drive an evolutionary process that's going to turn your apes into people. So like I said, you still haven't rebutted the fact that they're simple genomes, high population sizes, short generation times, and lower overall mutation rates. A combination of those make bacteria the most resistant to genetic entropy. But yet we see, you can just check a multitude of papers, bacteria adapt by losing genes. I, I, I feel like, I feel like you're going off. I, okay, I, I want to, so I just wanna my, hear my debate's on. My I want to hear about my points, man, because the name of the debate is, uh, you know, does bacteria disprove evolution? You're not doing too good here right now because it's a double whammy for us. Maybe I was a little too aggressive with the poor guy, but you know, it just gets so frustrating when these critics are using arguments that are not a fair misrepresentation of what we're saying or what the genetic entropy hypothesis is saying. So um, let me go to, let me go to Dr. Carter's explanation on this too. And keep this in mind, guys, this is an argument repeated over and over and over again. Dr. Dan himself is repeating it. So um, a lot of people are probably thinking to, them, to themselves like, what in the world? Their argument, their argument against genetic degeneration is bacteria or mice. I mean, talk about grasping at straws. But yeah, I'm here today to tell you guys that legit, these are their arguments. So we've dealt with whether or not beneficial mutations can counterbalance the damage. We showed that no, they can't. We've went over the trade-off. Okay. That's not going to work. Now we're dealing with uh, simple organisms and the arguments from bacteria and mice. We've dealt with extensively the argument that natural selection can solve this problem. That, that ain't going to solve the problem. We've also dealt with the, um, partly we've dealt with the math, the claims by people like um, Dan that kind of want to obfuscate the issue and say that the math has not been shown when in fact it has. They're just not up to date on the literature and the mainstream papers that confirm this. So now, um, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're taking it all out tonight, guys. This is an all inclusive refutation of, of their best arguments against genetic entropy. So here we go. Next clip. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Um, one, one final question on genetic entropy, Dr. Carter, because I know you wrote, you, you've written on this one and then we'll move on to kind of an, another topic. But I've heard critics endlessly claim that genetic entropy cannot be true because of the existence of bacteria and mice, for example. Now, is this a misrepresentation of what genetic entropy would claim or predict? And what would be the best way to respond to that argument? Uh, genetic entropy was written with long-lived complex organisms in mind. So humans and elephants we're doomed. And yet, if you look at mice, there are hundreds of subspecies of the common mouse. They have karyotypic differences. They have different chromosome counts. They're reproductively incompatible in a lot of cases, but they're the same thing. They're mice. And they were recently, were the same species. So they get isolated in a, in a sewer line or, you know, Delhi versus Bombay or something like that. And they don't, they're not able to exchange genes. They have such a high reproduction rate and such a high die-off rate. I mean, if, if mice reproduce you know, every 30 days, we'll say, if that's what their generation time is, maybe, maybe 60 days, whatever it is. That means that the entire mouse population gets replaced every 30 to 60 days. That's a recipe for natural selection with a large population with a high die-off rate. You might be able to get selection to keep on purifying something and, and prevent it from going extinct. And yet, because we see all these karyotypic differences, it's not true for mice. It might be true, though, for bacteria. I wrote a, um, an article on creation.com called Genetic Entropy in Simple Organisms. And I said that bacteria are the one thing that might escape genetic entropy. Because when E. coli reproduces its, its chromosome, there's less than one mutation per generation. It's a few million letters. The bacterial polymerases make a mistake every billion letters. So you could have E. coli reproducing with complete fidelity, no mutations. Second, well, if that E. coli population replaces itself every you know, 30 minutes to an hour worldwide, that means that there's an unbelievable turnover, which means that even a slight signal might be able to amplify itself over time when you have that much selection happening. So, oh, and plus, bacteria can go dormant for a long time. And so bacteria can be continually flushed back into the environment that are the original bacteria. In fact, E. coli today, there might be an E. coli around that has the same exact chromosome as the first E. coli. I doubt that, but it's possible. So genetic entropy might not apply to bacteria. It does apply to mice. It definitely applies to humans and things with very long lifespans and long generation times. 
it also applies to viruses. And it's like, it's like, it's like if it applies to humans but and mice, but not bacteria, well, the curve goes back up again. It definitely applies to viruses. We see mutation accumulation driving viral groups extinct. We see it all over the place. The um, influenza virus that I studied, we watched it go extinct. In fact, um, we published, a creationist published, that the human H1N1 virus that was circulating in the world since 1917 went extinct in 2009. The evolutionists didn't notice. That was the year the swine flu came out. The swine H1N1 was floating around, and nobody noticed the human one disappeared. Hmm. So after 1918 through uh, 2009, 90 years, actually a little less than that, it, it went extinct after about 13% of its genome had mutated. And it mutated randomly. We looked at the codons for the amino acids. We looked at all these different measurements. We said that this is just random chemistry because C tends to spontaneously deaminate, which turns it into a U. And then the proofreading enzymes fix that as a T. So you get the C to T changes are the most common changes in the genome. And A to G is the second most common change. And what we looked at is like, this is just chemistry. But wait, whoa, 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 chemistry? Uh-uh, that's not allowed in evolution. Natural selection has to overcome the second law of thermodynamics or all things are doomed to extinction. And yet when we look at the E. coli or the, um, sorry, E. coli, when we looked at the H1N1 genome, all we saw was the second law of thermodynamics. We could predict what changes would happen in the future based on chemistry alone. Incredible. Problem for them. I was up till two o'clock in the morning last night. And first thing in the morning, I was back at it. In fact, I worked until 7.30 or maybe 7.15. I went and took a shower and showed up here so I'm nice and clean. But I pounded keys all day today and I did nothing but align uh, COVID-19 genomes. Wow. I, I downloaded um, a 500 gigabyte file, which is all of the COVID-19 genomes that have been loaded to GenBank since July. I had all the ones from December to July. And I said, oh, I got to do it again. I, the, the file is huge. I spent all day lining this up so I can analyze the, the, the changes. And the changes, I mean, you can see a direction. It's going that way. Really? It's supposed to go that way. It's supposed to be natural selection does what it wants to it. Oh, no, it's going this way no matter what natural selection does. Interesting, because I, I've heard that the COVID-19 virus is actually about half as fast as the average typical cold flu. Is it much slower than you've noticed? And is it slower? It, yeah, yeah, or uh, mutation rate, for example. Um, um, the mutation rate, it is, it's hard to estimate because for the first five or six months, there were still viruses that were identical to the first virus that hadn't mutated yet. And other ones had 30 or 40 mutations. Got it. And so there's a, if you look at this, a cloud of points, you try to draw a line through it. Well, you know, where's that line go? But now that enough time has gone by, it's got about the same mutation rate as H1N1 and about the same mutation rate as Ebola. Wow. Okay. And Ebola is harder. We don't have as many sequences and they only go back to 1976. Not like, you know, H1N1 went back to 1918. That's a great zero point. 1976, there's not enough time to really see a nice, a linear accumulation in mutations. There's too much variation in spread. And that's what we're seeing in H1N1, uh, COVID-19. There's so much variation that we don't know, but over time, mutations will build up and build up and build up and build up, and then we can draw a line and I can tell you exactly what the mutation rate is. Nice, okay. Nice. So uh, uh, is it a safer type of a virus, meaning that because it mutates a little bit slower, that it would, uh, we don't have to be in much fear? Like most, you know, cold flu season comes, you know, every year they get a new vaccination, right? Because it's mutated so much, it doesn't resemble the original. But if COVID, what would you say to that? Um, I would say that the best thing that can happen to this virus is mutation. Got it. The evolutionists are afraid of mutation because they think that mutation leads to evolution. No, mutation leads to devolution. Mutation destroys things. Mutation weakens things. Yeah, maybe you can get some mutation that maybe the, the spike protein splits easier, therefore it's you know, twice as infectious or twice as deadly. Okay, this is possibly true, but those types of mutations are incredibly rare. Most of all the mutations are breaking the thing, making it weaker. That's how they treat AIDS. One of the, the primary way that, to keep a viral load in an AIDS patient down is you give them drugs that cause mutations. Mm. The viruses reproduce, they go into error catastrophe. Right. Remsevir is, is exact, it does exactly that. It causes, um, it causes reproductive problems in the virus. It mutates itself to, to, to non-existence. That's funny. It's ironic that they see it in one area, but they don't see it in the next. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, the way you just said it, though, you were hinting at, oh, let's be afraid of mutations. Right. But we shouldn't be, except that it is true that a mu new mutation can do something bad. And that new mutation might cause this thing to spread faster or to be more deadly. We don't want that to happen. But in general, lots of mutations will just destroy it. Well, there's a fatal blow to that one. Um, so Doki Doki and I have agreed. We are pulling an all-nighter tonight. So Doki Doki is putting on a pot of coffee. Doki, I'll take one cream, one sugar. We are partying tonight. Brother Sal, thanks for being here. We always appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. And God bless you. Have a good sleep. So, okay, so we've dealt with that argument. I want to point to just this part here on Dr. Sanford, okay? I want to point out that your really your best rebuttals, your only rebuttals are going to be found in blogs or YouTube videos because genetic degeneration has been so well verified, okay, and so well demonstrated 
Really? I mean, that's why it's like these critics deny reality that these critics can't debunk it through peer reviewed papers. They can't debunk Dr. Sanford through the peer reviewed journals. They just have to attack him in blogs. And um, I like the way that Sanford points that out here. So I want you guys to listen. And I was thinking to myself there, should I mute myself? And yes, because I, I want you guys to hear it without any echo. So listen to this. I think this is very telling. And Dr. Sanford himself says it best. So Doki Doki, thank you so much for the super sticker. Um, let's get this going. If you guys haven't seen this little clip, this clip's awesome. He nails it. Go through to, to Shem, the, the son of Noah, and then you go through and, and on down. It was remarkable, and it, it, it really does look like a, a typical decay curve. And now we're, we're in this flattened part of the curve, so you don't see those dramatic losses anymore. But it's much shorter lifespan. And, and uh, um, you know, we, we understand so much more from the Bible. So much has been given to us from this. And, uh, but I, I want to get back to this point. So you, you started, you know, this is, this is a sacred cow. When you start picking on Darwin, you start poking it at, at, at you know, the biggest idol there is in, in the sciences. And uh, uh, so this is never an easy fight. But I have seen exactly what you saw, that my colleagues will embrace something without ever knowing the evidence, without ever looking at the evidence, just because they assume other people have. And it's good. And so, you know, they believe it, I believe it, and we just take it based on, on faith. But what happened to this axiom as you started to dissect the, the, uh, the primary axiom, as you started to dissect this, what happened to it? And also what happened to you in the midst of this? Well, the axiom is something that is um, almost a religious icon. And so I was there, I was an atheist. For me, my foundational belief was evolution. And um, it's, it's a powerful, powerful paradigm. It's a powerful, powerful stronghold. It is a spiritual stronghold in my opinion. Uh, Darwinian evolution justified a lot of evil. Uh, it justified, uh, so I can't go into that, except that it's born bad fruit. And it's um, it's become, a, like you said, a sacred cow. What I've experienced has not been ridicule. Well, I'm sure there are people online ridiculing me. But I'm talking about uh, respectable scientists. Um, I don't get anybody challenging our work. Well, I know of two people who have actually vigorously challenged me. One was an engineer. I just had to point that out. Notice that no respectable, no reputable scientists. Yeah, some really militant critics <laughs> who just hate anything that might even hint at biblical creation, right? So you'll get arguments in blogs or over Facebook, Facebook groups, but nobody actually challenging Dr. Sanford. Nobody actually challenging genetic degeneration. So I want that to sink in, guys. You've got people like Dr. Dan that are constantly complaining and criticizing Dr. Carter and Dr. Sanford's work on the H1N virus that was published in a mainstream journal. You know, why didn't he go publish and show why the work done in that paper that was published in peer-reviewed mainstream journals is so erroneous. You know, these blog warriors. <laughs> so It's just so funny. Lena Powell laughs. Lena Powell says, nobody challenged Sanford's work so far. Nope. And he doesn't even need to go after these bloggers because guess what? He's got us. We're taking him out for him. So... Uh, okay, let, let, let's finish. I just really wanted to point that part out. So let's keep going. Engineer, and one was a physicist, but no one in the biological realm has challenged my work. I published maybe 20 papers in the last 20 years that are published in mainstream journals. The implications are clear. That is, the Arrhenian process doesn't work. 20 papers or so in the last however many years published verifying that the evolutionary processes, natural selection, mutations, they're not going to drive a fish to fishermen. Natural selection is not going to be able to filter out all of these mutations. 
that are pouring into our genetics. They're accumulating far too fast for selection to ever be able to remove. Benef even with super beneficial mutations. Go look at some of these papers um, from, you know, that are the result of Mendel's accountant and these numerical simulations. It doesn't matter how much purifying selection you add, you, you account for, or super beneficial mutations. It doesn't matter. The direction is always in, it, it's always going the way of degeneration. That's it. Mutations accumulate relentlessly. Lena Pau says, a bloggers, error catastrophe has never been observed experimentally nor in nature. I open Wikipedia where it is stated, error catastrophe is something predicted in mathematical models and has also been observed empirically. And here's what's funny. Dr. Dan misunderstands this. I see him use the argument all the time. Okay, inbreeding reveals the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes, okay? They are now manifested. And they oftentimes lead to accelerated genetic degeneration. So here's the thing. The more mutations we accumulate from generation to generation, the more mutations that can pop up from a recessive state, the more deleterious mutations you've accumulated in your genome, okay, the faster you are going to degenerate. It will accelerate. And that's what we see in these small inbred populations, right? And... It's just funny because when you look at the inbreeding, okay, look at the, the these inbred populations. The, we've seen it in butterflies, mammoths, Neanderthals, a lot of your hominins, right, so-called prehumans. They've experienced accelerated genetic degeneration due to inbreeding. Okay, I want to point out the fact that that, when you look at those small inbred populations, that is a sneak preview into where we are heading genetically as a species. Okay. Alec Cock Cock says, another pot of coffee. Nice. Yes. Coffee all day, every day. So um, I want to read what uh, Lena Powell said again. Error catastrophe is something predicted in mathematical models and has also been observed empirically. Amen. Okay, let's continue this one. So what's funny is um, Creo debunk says that, you know, we don't understand apparently that, well, Creo is not even worth it. I mean, we spent an hour and a half debunking. We, we've literally de debunked exactly what he said. You know, these are the critics. This is the best they got. <laughs> the keyboard warriors, the bloggers. And no matter how many times you correct them or refute their arguments and objections, okay, they're still going to repeat it like a broken record, you know? Creo, what type of selection can you present us with today that can filter out so many mutations that are effectively neutral, accumulating from generation to generation? Present us tonight that type of selection. I'd love, I'd love to see it. Okay, let's finish this uh, clip here. But we don't say that, and we're, uh, we've found enough um, editors to let us publish that work. Where we've published our work, no one has challenged it. In other words, our work is sound scientifically. Um, but I have tried to uh, communicate with population geneticists, uh, trying to get a dialogue, and they won't, they won't dialogue. They won't respond to emails. It's kind of a shunning thing. And um, to me, it's encouraging because uh, I, had a, I have a good friend who, who's an evolutionist, and he's not a Christian yet. And, um, Number one, I asked him, I gave him the book, I said, have you read it? And, uh, and he didn't answer, and then I, months later, I said, did you, have you read it? He said, I've read it twice. I cannot find anything wrong with it. But he said, we'll figure out the answers to these problems one of these days. And I said, why won't they engage me? Why won't my colleagues engage me? He said, they don't have answers. And I believe that's, you know, I, used, I initially assumed they would tear me to pieces, and I would be murdered, more or less, from an academic point of view. Instead, I've been uh, just ignored. Uh, and it's, to me, it means they don't have answers. And that means uh, that actually increases my confidence that in spite of the group think, uh, the paradigm's wrong. If evolution happened, it didn't happen by mutation selection. There's just many levels of information, many, many reasons why random mutation and uh, limited selection can make things get better. 
and this includes because th th this this also then includes neutral drift because because uh, I've been told by geneticists that that they no longer are pushing uh, random mutation and natural selection. They are pushing uh, neutral drift, the changes that occur from a parent to their children and then onto their children, and the theory of universal common descent. So it, that's that's the new paradigm: neutral drift and universal common descent. What what does your your analysis of of the 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 data look like uh, to address that? So, uh, it doesn't work. Um, number one, uh, mutations are pouring in, let's say in the human genome, we get about 100 new mutations per generation per year. Um, most of those are, um, almost none of those are beneficial. Think about typographical errors uh, in, put into a text, it, you always lose information that's uh, basically zero beneficials. Uh, and the um, most of the mutations are deleterious, but most of them are only slightly deleterious. Slightly deleterious mutations are deadly because you can't, mother nature can't see them, natural selection can't filter them out. So they accumulate like rust on a car. So we have serious mutations that are. So what he said there is key. Okay, mother nature can't see these mutations that are only slightly deleterious, slightly damaging. And those, out of those 100 new mutations accumulating from generation to generation, almost none of them are beneficial. And we've talked about how when you do get that one rare beneficial mutation, it's still reductive, still fun functionally compromising to the organism. It's not taking things forward. And notice how Creo in the chat can't debunk anything we've said, can't present us with any type of selection that can filter out these mutations that are like single typographical errors in a text accumulating slowly over time in a book the size of an encyclopedia. Over time, they, they accumulate enough to the point where they degrade the message, destroy the message. And this has all been verified through published papers, verified by Dr. Sanford himself with no challenge. Okay, and these blog warriors, those don't count. That's a legit challenge, okay? Mother Nature cannot pick out each nucleotide, you know, that, that each mutation that, that is accumulated, okay? Because selection acts on the phenotype, not the genotype. And even if you get a beneficial mutation, all the other negative mutations are being carried along with it. And what's funny is Creo is so blind, so ignorant, can't debunk anything. He is bringing up the Parsons paper when we've already gone in great detail. I even screen shared the response with the response we got from Parsons challenging these blog warriors and keyboard warriors to publish their critiques so he can systematically dismantle them because he's been dealing with it for years and he's sick of it. Okay, Creo won't be able to answer the question as to why, as to why there's so few mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. Between any two people on this planet, there's only a few mutations separating us from the mitochondrial Eve DNA sequence. There's few mutations and the mutation rate is fast, a lot faster than ever expected. So Creo. Quit being a keyboard warrior. Explain to us, why is there so few mutations in the mitochondrial DNA? Why is there such low variation in the mitochondrial DNA? Why is the mutation rate so fast, way too fast for deep time evolution? Okay? And we account for purifying selection, bottlenecks, genetic drift. It doesn't matter. Okay? When we look at these mitochondrial DNA phylogenetic trees, we're only looking at a few hundred generations. Otangelo Grasso, good to see you, brother. Great job in that debate. Otangelo is still undefeated. Can't be beat. So Creo now dodges, ducks, dips, dives, and dodges all over the place. All over the place. Doesn't even give us a type of selection. <laughs> Keyboard warrior doesn't even give us a type of selection that can filter out these mutations that are unselectable. How exactly many MTD mutations there are. Okay, 
There's only a few separating most people. And the most you're going to find on the planet, say somewhere in Africa, is about 100. 100. Let's look at the Y chromosome. Let's look at the Y chromosome, Creo. Your critic that can't back up what you say, can't back up your arguments, parroting arguments that we've already just spent an hour and a half debunking. Tell me this. Every single Y chromosome on the planet, male Y chromosome, nearly identical. I just gave you the exact number, Creo. Tell us. How do you get to your date for your eve of a couple hundred thousand years old? Do I got to pull up the mitochondrial DNA phylogenetic chart? Yeah, see, Creo dodges, he ducks, he dips, he dives, he dodges. He's probably Dan. <laughs> probably Dan or CRISPR. Oh, do I got to pull up the Parsons response again? I mean, the fact that Creo doesn't know how many mutations we are removed approximately from the mitochondrial DNA Eve sequence. Creo doesn't even know that we have Eve sequence. He's so behind, like all of these evolutionist critics. I want to show you guys how people like Creo, people like Dan, people like Erica, I'm going to show you guys how they read these technical papers. Okay, there you go. There's Creo right there. Creo tries to say, oh, genetic entropy is just an invention in the mind of the young earth creationist. Then, then you show them mainstream papers confirming genetic degeneration. Mainstream papers, population geneticists acknowledging the fact that mutations are accumulating at an alarmingly high rate. But this is how he reads them. This is how he reads them. Creo, watch out. Young Earth creation is coming after you. We're coming after you with empirical science. Oh, still waiting for that type of selection, Creo. You want to jump in here with me? Maybe, uh, I mean, being a keyboard warrior is typically... Uh, typically easier than live debate. See, this is why, you know, I, I got my <laughs> I got my Facebook account and I've already got some trolls. One guy named Barry keeps saying, when are you going to spend your, 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 your the next month with me in text debate? I'm like, come debate me live where I can actually expose you instead of you dodging all over the place. You know, here's what these guys want to do. They want to take you away. You know, Brother Neff, he talks about this. They want to take you away from actually getting some good solid work done, you know, and they want to take you away into the Facebook comment section for a month straight where they can copy and paste things. They can dodge, they can duck, they can dip, they can dive. They can dodge all over the place. No, come debate me live. Bring it on. Evolutionist keyboard warriors. Oh, so funny. Text debate. <laughs> Elena Powell says text debate. Yeah, I got better things to do. You know, that, that's where they really can't answer your questions, you know. At least Todd, at least you get Todd in a live debate and, and you get a meme out of it. I'm not going to fall for that trap. Look at Creo. Comes in trolling, just straight up troll. Still has, okay, so let's see. Creo, 0 for 3. Can't explain the Y chromosome data, okay. Can't explain why uh, such low variation in Y chromosome, even though we've got a high mutation rate in the Y chromosome. The only conclusion is that it's young. He can't explain that to us. Um, mitochondrial DNA, we know Eve sequence. Only a few mutations removed from the Eve sequence. Max, there's about 100, say in Africa. But the mitochondrial DNA, DNA mutates fast. No answer to that. I'd love to know how he gets to his date. Because even when we account for purifying selection, bottlenecks, genetic drift, okay, somatic mutations, dyads, triads, you name it. Even when you deal with all of those things, consider all those things, you're nowhere near the deep time evolution date. So anyways, here's the problem with text debate, okay? Now Creo is Googling an answer. He's going on uh, teamdodgeball.com. <laughs> Look at his next question. How fast does it mutate? <laughs> oh, guys. Anyways. Oh, so funny. You know, Creo, I'm going to get you to debate my four-year-old daughter because she'd still win, but it'd be a little bit more of a challenge. Challenge for you. 
Oh, Cole says, why don't you use genetic entropy in, in debate much anymore? My last, good question. My last few debates, my last several debates have been kind of on my book that I wrote, Independent Origin. So I focus heavily on like the mitochondrial data, the Y chromosome data. But uh, lately, like the last couple after shows, I've gotten back into the whole genetic entropy argument. And I've realized, you know, they have no answer for it. So that's why we're... We're going back to the roots. That's why I wanted to do this stream tonight, just to um, refresh everybody's memory on genetic entropy, debunk their best arguments. Um, so, yeah. Creo, <laughs> come on, man. Come at me, bro. <laughs> oh. Still waiting for a type of selection that can filter out so many unselectables. Still waiting for rebuttals to Mendel's accountant and the number of mainstream papers. 5.30 a.m., we got 25 people in the chat. Well, we can safely conclude that Creo is easier to expose than, than Todd himself. I'm not falling for that trap, so... Um, Doki Doki Bible Club. Creo, I wish there was more people like you. Creo, um, www.teamdodgeball.com. You'll find a lot of great answers there. Creo says, there is a valid model about removal mutation. I'll not say it to you. Yeah, yeah. Just want to let you know, synergistic epistasis mutation count mechanism. Both been falsified thoroughly. Trade-off ain't going to work for you. We've debunked bacteria the bacteria argument we've debunked um we've shown that there's been no explanation for the net gain versus net loss beneficial mutations are not going to counterbalance the damage natural selection can't see the unselectables it can only act on phenotype not genotype so we've dealt with it all you've had your chance and you've failed miserably uh, raw matt brother can you um creo send matt your your address and he's going to send you one of our new team dodgeball shirts. You've earned it. You don't, you, no, no, I don't want you to pay for it. We don't want your money. You're, we're going to send it to you free. Okay. And if you send us a picture of your face, <laughs> we'll even plaster your face on the back of it too. So uh, it's, it's again, it's, you've earned it. You've earned it. Brother Matt. So not seeing some is even worse for evolution. Oh, too fun. All right, he had his chance. I'm going back to the video, guys. No more time wasted on Creo. Here we go. What caused immediate damage? You know, suddenly, you know, you have hemophilia or something. Uh, but most of the damage is microscopic and it has to accumulate over time, but it's unstoppable. Low, low impact mutations are unselectable, whether they're good or bad. So it means that uh, if you're just drifting, you're losing information. Drift is deadly. It's, uh, it's, the reason they went to drift is they realized that too many mutations are accumulating, and so therefore most of them must be neutral. But there are more and more evidence that, that it isn't junk DNA, it's all functional, and that any mutation is not going to be neutral. It's overwhelmingly going to be bad. So the neutral thing is basically uh, people playing they're kind of um, dodging the bullet, but a neutral evolution means no progress and certain rusting out of the genome, which will lead to death. It's a slow death rather than a fast death. That's all that it is. So just let me, just for our audience, so we're not evolving in a better way, we're devolving, and there's this, this constant degradation to the human race, not just to the human race, to, to, to all creatures, uh, just as we saw with, with that, uh, uh, that bacteria. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, the, the virus, I'm sorry, the virus mutation, and, and you, you saw this degradation. Now, now th let me ask you, can you, can you tell us about Project ENCODE and what that meant? So Project ENCODE was to look at what was formerly called junk DNA and find out, is there function in all of this junk? What are we finding out about what was formerly called junk DNA? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to ask, why were they so eager to believe that most of the genome would be junk? It's kind of illogical. Uh, if evolution is making everything better and fine-tuned, then how could you just be accumulating? 98% of the genome being junk. Uh, so uh, the original estimate by Mueller, Mueller was in the 50s, 
uh, and he was the only Nobel laureate in the area of population genetics. He was um, he discovered that radiation causes mutations. He was very concerned for humanity because he said if if, if we have uh, even one mutation per person per generation, the human race will degenerate because you can't um, basically you can only accommodate so much mutation. You can't select it all away. If everybody has at least one more mutation than their parents, uh, even if you select away the inferior individuals, everybody's still more mutant. So he said if mutation rates get as high as one mutation per generation, we can be certain the human race. Notice, even if you select away the inferior individuals, mutations are still gonna uh, are still going to accumulate. You could have a genome that is eighty percent junk, ninety percent junk, ten percent functional. That's it. Still too much for evolution. That's it. They're they're still going to accumulate consistently, degrade, degenerate. And as uh, Dr. Sanford said there, it's a slow death. This will eventually degenerate. So that's pretty amazing coming from the top person in the field ever. And uh, now we know it's 100 mutations per generation. So one way that um, biologists have tried to get around that problem is they say, well, there's 100 mutations per generation, but 99% of them are junk. And so therefore they don't cause any harm. Those mutations don't have any effect. But ENCODE has shown that it's a huge part of the genome is functional, way more than Mueller could tolerate, more, way more than the population could uh, tolerate. And ENCODE's first estimate was 80% of the genome is functional. And then there was a lot of debate. And they said, OK, we still haven't, we have to do more analysis. We're only going to say 60% is functional. But people were still realizing that's deadly. Uh, 60 mutations per generation is totally deadly. Uh, in the last 10 years, ENCODE has shown us there's been ENCODE 1, ENCODE 2, ENCODE 3 four different stages of ENCODE. And it's a huge network of scientists, mainstream people. And what they're finding, every time they dig deeper, they find more and more function. And not just function throughout the genome, but extravagant, unbelievably sophisticated functions that are all interacting with each other. And so ENCODE, NIH's projects, basically the people at NIH um, are awed. They're, they're starting to, they are amazed at what the data is showing them. And they're not, it's not exactly perfectly correct for them to say that, but there is awe, growing awe, as we study the genome more. It's more functional than anything we could have designed ever. And what we're finding, and you mentioned it in your book, but, but uh, even more recently than your book goes into, is, uh, is that the multiple levels of information within DNA. We, we, we talk about these codons, these three units, and they specify something, but depending on where you start, depending, you can have all of these multiple levels of information in this, in this genome that, that, that uh, go way beyond what we had ever seen. And uh, you might want to touch on that, but also let me, let me ask you, aren't there rescue mechanisms built in that, that protect us from the, same, the degradations that you're talking about? Okay, so let's start with the first one, with the second one first, and then we'll come back to the, um, and remind me, because I have time to forget what the first question was. But um, there are unbelievably sophisticated rescue mechanisms. The first one is that our actual mutation rate is much, much higher than what we actually see. In other words, uh, without DNA repair enzymes, you know, without, without a mechanism to, to um, repair most mutations, we would, we would die in months. So uh, we would mutate to death in months. So DNA repair enzymes, there's many of them. Thank God for those DNA repair mechanisms. Like he said, if it were not for those forward thinking mechanisms designed in our genome, then we would be extinct in a matter of months. And when you ask the evolutionists these questions, you know, how do you explain these mechanisms in our genetics, including epigenetics? How do you explain this from a naturalistic perspective? How, what type of evolutionary mechanism can, it, can evolve that which requires forward thinking? And their answer is always, and they don't even realize it, is they're ascribing mutations, natural selection, other evolutionary processes with a mind. Forward thinking mechanisms require a forward thinker, necessitates a forward thinker. They run up and down the DNA strands looking for recent mistakes. They can only repair a mistake before the DNA is replicated. Once, it's kind of like once the paint is dried, you can't get rid of it. So these, these enzymes are running up and down the DNA continuously, repairing 99.9% .9 of all mutations. Incredibly sophisticated. How can a molecule recognize a mutation and know how to, how to fix it? It's a repair enzyme that's uh, it just it is, is more sophisticated than anything we've ever designed. Just I just had to point out the, the, the good super chats. Oops. Doki Doki says, I'm not falling for that trap. Yeah. But then uh, 
Matt, I'm not falling for no questions. Yeah, that's that's Creo. Creo says I'm not falling for no questions. So Creo, you've you've turned into a meme. This is awesome. He says require a forward thinker. Yeah, so how do you? Uh, what type of mechanism evolves these DNA repair mechanisms in our genetics? Because natural selection, Creo, sees the short term, not the long term. But these forward thinking mechanisms, okay, including the epigenome, requires forward thinking. <laughs> but remember, natural selection acts in the short term. So um, would definitely love an answer to that one. Let me see. George Bond, reading through these chats while talking. The Evo's junk DNA is a creationist treasure. Yep. Junk DNA is junk science, George. Junk science. Game over. Here it is. The DNA language. Okay, we're learning, we're learning so much every single day about the function of the genome. And it's like this. We know so little, okay, especially on the developmental stages, how the DNA works and coordinates to bring together that fully functioning organism at birth. Here's the thing. It would be akin to me. I speak no Russian. I don't know any Russian, zero. It would be like hiring me to go over to Russia and become a proofreader for some new Russian books. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to tell you what's a mistake. I'm not going to be able to tell you really what anything's saying. You know, that's what it's like in the DNA language. We're finding out so much more. We know there's a ton of activity. And we know that based on the evidence, preliminary evidence for genome-wide functionality, we can safely as creationists make predictions on DNA function, predictions on specific DNA positions. DNA positions that, if mutated, will result in disease. Raw Matt himself has a number of predictions in print as well, some even in peer review on de novo mutations. You know, creationists are the ones making the predictions. So, just the DNA process, but all systems are imperfect. And so, there's just enough mutations to get through uh, that escape the DNA repair so that we have 100 mutations per generation still, even after the DNA repair. Now, a second major uh, protection is we are diploid. We have every single gene we have is in duplicate. That's so that if one gets broken, the other one's still functional. And so that's amazing. But even then, eventually, um, you get two, the same location gets two broken strains, same gene gets hit at two places. And so uh, this process of um, duplication, it's like having an extra a backup computer or in a space shuttle, four backup computers. We have this, it's a fantastic system, but in the end, it still doesn't keep us from degenerating. Mm -hmm. So, you, so even with this, wanna... the, the, the levels of information within DNA. Okay, so so for a long time we've taught that the information is in the DNA, and uh, and that's that's it's that simple. So biological information is just understanding DNA and how it works. It turns out that DNA is just the foundation, the building blocks or the foundational blocks building the, for building the skyscraper. There's layer upon layer of information, and so everything above and beyond the DNA code is called epigenetics. And so epigenetics has layer upon layer. Um, it's Kind of mind-boggling to understand that, except to just realize that it's there. There's uh, extra information in the histone proteins that bind to the DNA. There's extra information in the editing of the RNA viruses that come off of the DNA. And then there's all kinds of um, what we call post-translational modifications of proteins. Proteins are getting, it's like going and finding a protein and discovering that it has 10 or 20 switches on. And the functionality of that protein depends on which switches get flipped. So these post-modificational, post-translational modifications means that every protein has many different functional states and that that has to be regulated. So the protein is in its right state depending on what type of cell it's in and, and what's going on in the cell. So we're talking about layer upon layer of information, and we, we have not reached the end of that series. It's like a, a it just goes on forever. It's like information. It, it's like God wants to blow our mind, and he's doing it. It's like, why did God make faraway galaxies? And the answer is, so, we can, so now in this century, we can see them. God is showing stuff that is just, that anyone who's willing to receive it will, will fall down before God and say, thank you for your fantastic creation. Just like Dr. Sanford said there, it's like God is doing his best to blow our minds and he's doing it layer upon layer of information, information compression into every single nucleotide. It's amazing. You know, and the evolutionists from the naturalistic paradigm, they can't account for this. As we've seen with good old Creo. Creo, you've been a good sport. 
you've been a good sport. It's been fun. We, we, we like when you're in the chat because I can engage you like this. And that's what's amazing. And this is why I asked that question to Dr. Dan in, in our last video, the Abiogenesis Challenge. Dan, explain to us how this four-dimensional genome, okay, this four-dimensional genome comprising of multiple overlapping codes and chock full of meta information, how did this come about? Because goo to you evolution has to explain these naturalistic mechanisms ascribed to evolution has to explain these forward thinking mechanisms. You can't even show me a human information system that can even remotely begin to compare to this multi-dimensional genome. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, as Dr. Sanford was saying, okay, the set of instructions in our genetics, in every single one of you, it's not just this simple linear array of letters, okay? People in the past, they used to look at the genome very in more of a simple manner, okay? It was the whole one gene, one protein, one function paradigm way of thinking things. But what we now know is that the genome, it's dynamic, it's multidimensional, it's nested, it's self-regulating, okay? And as Dr. Sanford was pointing out, it's a lot more active, a lot more function, a lot more functional, than we ever thought. That means they can no they can no longer resort to the rescue device that states that because most of the genome is non-functional, these mutations that accumulate from generation to generation, they'll hit those non-functional regions and they'll be absorbed, making them absolutely neutral. No, it's not going to happen, okay? It's not going to happen. These low impact mutations are accumulating. Okay. And I want to point out the fact that, um, actually, let's see the chat. Um, Speed, good to see you. Good to see you. I hope you're well. I hope you're getting better. You've been in our prayers. So good to see you. Speed's pro probably thinking, wow, these guys got up early. They're streaming. Oh, Speed, we're pulling an all nighter. Doki Doki put on a pot of coffee and we thought, you know what? We're going to talk about genetic entropy all night long. Anthony Maurice, the man himself. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Maurice, you going to take the uh, abiogenesis challenge? <laughs> uh, just kidding. Tony, you're the man. None of them. None of them are taking it. Um. So anyways, you know, let, let, let's think about it. We've debunked all their best so-called arguments. We've, we've shown, we've demonstrated why the trade-off, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. They're not addressing the key issue of net gain versus net loss. No amount of beneficial mutations are going to counterbalance the damage. The numbers have been done. You know, let me screen share. Before we end this, let me screen share. We'll make it up to the um, we'll make it up to the two hour mark and then call it a day. Super redeemed energy. Good to see you. So here's something that I really want to point out. I made a post in the community the other day on Mendel's accountant. And Dr. Carter was talking about it earlier, how these critics don't understand the program. They misrepresent the data. They misrepresent and straw man the model. Okay. Because people like Dr. Dan, they say, you know, what about this? What about this? And it's like, these have all been done. There's been articles and papers written on this. With Mendel's accountant, you can run any simulation you want. And this is what I wanted to get to, guys. Success has brought criticism, right? Just like uh, Dr. Sanford was saying, no, nobody's challenged him. Nobody's challenged his uh, large number of papers that have been published in the mainstream journals. Just your bloggers, people that are misrepresenting the data. So it says here, a Google search for Mendel's accountant will bring up multiple hits. Most of those probably from Dan <laughs> that criticize the program and the conclusions being drawn from its discoveries. Essentially, none of these attacks are substantive. 
and many are highly misleading. It is clear that most people commenting on Mendel have not read either the documentation or the background papers. Thus, many evolutionists arguing against it don't seem to understand their own theory. Isn't that funny that we understand their own theory better than they understand their own theory? This is probably due to the anonymous nature of the internet and the level of expertise required to make comments online. One thing that comes to mind is we systematically dismantled every single second of Erica and Swamidas, Stramidas, because he's strawmanning our position all the time, we systematically dismantled every second of that. And we pointed out how many times they misrepresented the data, they misrepresented to the point of just being right out dishonest about Dr. Jensen. And I find it funny because Erica knows she can't address our, our arguments. She can't address our rebuttals to that portion. To We've got a whole playlist of 12 videos so far debunking her latest three and a half hour video. And Dan attempted to rebut one of the five or 10 minute videos. And I did a two hour or so response to that showing that he addressed nothing. But here's the thing, there are no answers. And that's why she's saying, oh, you know, I'm tapping out because they're not answering my questions. No, Erica repeated her arguments from these types of blogs. And these type of types of blogs contain so much misinformation, so much misrepresentation. So now she's got nowhere else to go. She can't go to the mainstream journals. She's got to go to the blogger. So she's tapping out and that's okay. We're fine with that. Okay. So let's see. Um, and the level of expertise required to make comments online. No understanding required right here. Look, no understanding required. Or they read the papers blindfolded like we showed earlier. However, one anti-creationist blogger, not trained in either biology or genetics as it shows, and it shows, tried to build a credible case against the genetic entropy thesis and thus tangentially attacked Mendel's accountant. Um, actually there's, yeah, there's a good one here, you guys, if you want to read it, um, this one breaks it down briefly. Actually, I want to show you, I want to show you the number of papers you guys should be looking at down here. Okay. So click view all. Mendel's accountant, a new population genetics simulation tool for studying mutation and natural selection. Using computer simulation to understand mutation accumulation dynamics and genetic load. Mendel's account, a biologically realistic forward time population genetics program. I mean, tons of articles, papers, papers from mainstream journals, papers from creationist journals that have never even been looked at. Which is why people like Dr. Dan repeat the same arguments. Oh, the math has not been done. Synergistic epistasis been dealt with, falsified mutation count mechanism. Right here, can synergistic epistasis halt mutation account, uh, accumulation results from numerical simulation? It's all been done. It's all been done, guys. Carter Sanford, the H1N1. Um, yeah, you know, you're not going to find much substance from these critics any longer. Dr. Sanford here gives a solid rebuttal to one of these, one of these bloggers. I want to point this out too. One of my co-authors went to Japan to spend several days discussing with her. Um, let me see. Uh, now, for context, I should start from the part, the top. Dr. Tomoko Ota was a key student of Komora and published extensively with Komora. Dr. Ota came to be known as the queen of population genetics and is now an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an associate of the National Academy of Sciences USA. She is the world's authority on the topic of near neutral mutations. One of my co-authors went to Japan to spend several days discussing with her a manuscript in which we use numerical simulation to clearly demonstrate that near-neutral deleterious mutations generally escape selective removal and lead to continuous and linear accumulation of genetic damage. She acknowledged that our numerical simulations appeared to be valid, 
and that our conclusions appeared to be valid. This clearly reflects a profound evolutionary paradox. It is the same paradox Kondrashov addressed in his paper, Why Have We Not Died a Hundred Times Over? When asked about synergistic epistasis, she immediately acknowledged that synergistic epistasis should make the problem worse, not better, just as I, being Dr. Sanford, argue in my book. Using numerical simulations, we have confirmed that synergistic epistasis fails to slow mutation accumulation and accelerates genetic decline. I think Dr. Oda would like me to clarify that she is a faithful Darwinist and remains committed to the primary axiom and that she is in fact hostile to the thesis of my book. See, here's the thing. You got population geneticists that acknowledge the fact mutations are accumulating. They're accumulating far faster than natural selection can remove such mutations. And this is why they build these rescue mechanisms, mutation count mechanism, mut um, a synergistic epistasis, they've been dealt with. It's all been dealt with. Um, Kimura's figure, we talked about that. So we've actually, yeah, we've really hammered this, guys. We've gone over two hours. We've interacted with the chat. Creo's made it fun. Just want to make sure we got everything that we wanted to in the form of videos. I had about, what, six up here. I wanted to go through this one, but maybe we'll save that one for another day. Uh, bacteria, we've addressed that one. Gene duplications. And you know, I think I'll save this for a part two. I was going to go over uh, Paul Price. He does a great job in his um, in his debate with Dr. Garrett. So one final check-in on the chat. We've gone for over two hours. This has been a lot of fun, guys. 6 a.m. We've still got 25 people in the chat. So um Doki Doki, last minute super chat. Thank you so much. Doki Doki says, what's the exchange rate on real science to angry blogs? <laughs> angry bloggers. And don't forget, don't forget. Where is it? There we go. This is how they read the papers we cite. Take the blindfold off. Take the blindfold off. So uh, let's see. Thank you, Doki Doki, for the super chat. And super sticker, Doki Doki, thank you. Speed says, I'm up early waiting for you guys to fall asleep. You know, I think the caffeine's wearing down. I can feel it now. I should probably counterbalance it with some water. In the same way that you evolutionists want to counterbalance the damage done by all of these low impact mutations accumulating from generation to generation, unselectable, invisible. I need to counterbalance the caffeine in the coffee intake with some water. Let's see. George Bond says he's going to celebrate with some ice cream. Yes. George, celebrate the demise of pond scum to people, goo to you evolution with some ice cream. Oh, speed of sound of gravity says, let's debate genetic entropy on my channel right now. See? See, he wants to get me when I'm tired, when I've been awake all day and it's 6 a.m. I know your tricks there, Speed. Well, what Team Dodgeball can do, go through this two-hour video. We've addressed all the possible arguments. We've shown why there's been no legitimate case to be made against genetic entropy. Dr. Sanford confirmed this for us. Confirmed this for us. So, um, yeah. We, we've done good. It's been a good night. As always, you guys in the chat are awesome. You make this fun. I love interacting with you guys. Lots of good points from all of you, which makes the uh, the stream that much better. With your help, we've been able to, um, we've been able to, George Bond says, don't fall for that trap, SFT. <laughs> never do. Never. Do. You know, I want to, uh, Raw Matt, he might be sleeping now, but... If he's in the chat, I'm going to let him know. We need to make two two, two new shirts, Team Dodgeball and the uh, I'm not going to fall for that trap shirt, that Todd. You know, I'm, I'm really thankful that Speed introduced us to Todd because the whole don't, I'm not going to fall for that trap line, it's been one of uh, Team SFT's favorites. We love it. We love it. So, um, Luca. 
Sorry, I'm going to eat. See you all. Hey, you lasted two hours, Luca. I only said we were going to be here for an hour, but I need to stop saying that because every time I say that, what, wh however long I say we're going to be streaming for, double that. So if I say two hours, we'll be here for four probably. <laughs> Rob Matt says, two new shirts coming right up. Yeah, they'll be ready in 10 minutes. He's got uh, quite the workshop over at his house. <laughs> George Bond says Toddism. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, anyways, we'll end with um, we'll end the way we began with the announcements and the good news. So next week, Wednesday or Thursday, I got to check my schedule. I've got a ton on it. We've got Dr. Jason Lyle is going to be with us. I am excited for that one. Um, we've got David McQueen. Economic geologist. Did I say that right, George? He's going to be on uh, Friday. That's going to be awesome. Brother Sal is going to be here for part three of protein probabilities. You're not going to want to miss out on that one. And um, Dr. McKay, geologist, we've got him in about a week and a half. So, and a couple debates too that I'm in the midst of confirming. One that was confirmed. Tonight, Nephilim Free versus Jordan. He's the nuclear engineer. Uh, he's been on a couple times. He's debated Kent. He's debated myself and Rama. That was a good debate. He's also debated Bill Morgan. He'll be debating Neff on the age of the earth. That's December 4th. So anyways, guys, this has been fun. Alec says the coffee force is strong. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Tony, good to see you, brother. As always, God bless. Okay, guys. God bless everybody. It's been fun. It's been fun. Um, you guys are great as always. And as I always end it with, SFT is out. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button.